Oke, okay, silakan Ibu Tuti. Oke, okay, makasih Mbak Widya. Siapa dirimu, Said? Oke, okay, uh, sebelumnya terima kasih atas kehadiran uh, Pak Iswandaro dan Mbak Dewi. Kita udah pernah ketemu ya Pak Iswandaro yang belum ya. Iya, Insya Allah nanti ya. <laughs> Baik, uh, izinkan saya untuk uh, memulai acara ini. So, and, um, bisa nanti uh, saya memulainya dalam bahasa Inggris. Nanti uh, mungkin tanya jawabnya atau materinya dicampur bahasanya silahkan aja ya Pak ya. Ya boleh boleh. Preferensinya bahasa Inggris atau bahasa Indonesia penyampaiannya? Um, <laughs> Dari dari LPPM-nya gimana Mbak Ari? Bahasa Inggris, Mbak Tuti. Bahasa Inggris, oke. Okay. Tapi ya. mungkin nanti pertanyaan dari mahasiswa, silahkan aja kalau ada yang ya mau pakai bahasa Indonesia dulu ya. Atau Betul. mau latihan sekalian bahasa Inggris juga silahkan. Bagus. Baik, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Honorable Mr. and Madam Speakers, distinguished guests, fellow students and ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome all of you to this pre prestigious uh, seminar. Um, so international upbringing is a public lecture, lecture activity held by international office of Universitas Pertamina that presents practitioner from industry or agencies, as well as expert from universities to provide insight to students and lecturers from various departments and also to public in general. Um, international upbringing is a help in the form of lectures and it's a part of learning process related to the field of science or technology or field of concentration of a study of, of a program. Um, okay, and uh, so we move to our next uh, agenda, that is to listen uh, an, an introduction and closing, uh, sorry, opening remarks from uh, Pak Budi uh, Sucipto, is uh, our uh, Vice Rector of Research, Development and Partnership, Universitas Pertamina. To Pak Budi, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ibu Tuti. Uh, it's our pleasure uh, to have uh, international bringing this afternoon Indonesian time. Um, and we are very honored to have uh, uh, Dr. Iswandaru and Ibu Dewi as our uh, speakers for this uh, our first international bringing we try to hold the event this event every month uh, to broaden our knowledge so that we know the new development of the knowledge uh, abroad not only from indonesia i know because of this pandemic so we talk about pandemic a lot and we kind of uh, circling around and uh, but the life must go on uh, we have we, we, we still have to learn and we, we still have to broaden our uh, horizon that's why we uh, come up with this uh, upbringing session <clears throat> for uh, actually we uh, also would like to inform all the participants uh, that for next month we uh, we have already uh, confirmed speakers uh, from uh, Harriet Watt, Dr. Bahman Tohidi, and from Saudi uh, Aramco, uh, Dr. Ardian Nengkoda, uh, who will uh, talk about flow assurance. Um, 
for our second uh, international upbringing. So anyway, uh, this is, I think, very valuable session, a very uh, rare session we have. And I know the time is not uh, good because this is a kind of uh, a slow down time. However, uh, to prevent further slowing down, so it's better for us to, to learn something new from these two experts, uh, although they're Indonesians, but they have lived abroad for so many, many years. Uh, so they know a lot about many things, including uh, technology, uh, uh, implementation of technology that they are going to discuss this afternoon. So uh, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, I just uh, wish you all enjoy uh, the session. Please ask questions uh, as needed. Uh, you can, I think uh, Ibu Tuti as a moderator uh, would direct you, you know, how to ask questions and then would uh, manage the session so that uh, most of you uh, get benefits from this afternoon. Uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the session. I return to Ibu Tuti. Thank you, Pak Bundi. Um, so uh, next we move to our next activity. That is, uh, before that, I would like to introduce our presenters. Um, we, Already in the room, uh, Dr. Eswanderu Widyatmoko, he is a technical director, R&D, Transportation and Infrastructure Materials, ACOM, United Kingdom. That was our first speaker. And the second one, uh, she is uh, named Sagung Dewi Kencana, PhD, uh, Assistant Professor of Department of Mechanical Engineering, National Taiwan University of Science and Technology, Taiwan. So um, I would like to uh, please uh, Dr. Iswandaru with Yamoko to present uh, his materials to the audience. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to share my screen uh, one moment yeah would you please try that first okay it's perfect perfect all right uh good afternoon uh everyone i i hope everyone can can see the uh, the big screen uh in front of you this is my presentation today uh it's an hour an honor uh, for me uh, to be able to share this with you i hope this can be of use uh, Thank you for the introductions. Uh, I've been in Nottingham since uh, 1999, uh, working on the uh, R&D. Um, also since uh, last year, uh, I started uh, supporting uh, Universitas Pertamina as well. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I just want to go straight to uh, the uh, uh, presentations. Before that, just a, a small introduction about what I've been doing here with my team in Nottingham. Uh, the, uh, the works that we are doing uh, mainly focus on practical research. So how to implement research that's been developed either by university or by other research centers into practices. And uh, my team uh, mainly works on the uh, research in infrastructure. So from uh, innovation uh, in uh, road, uh, airport or port infrastructure assets, uh, it can be a uh, public or commercial assets or uh, military asset as well. But for today, what we are going to uh, do is to share with you uh, a few uh, smart uh, uh, targets uh, for our discussion today. One, we will talk a little bit about uh, sustainable uh, development goals and then how to manage a, a risk in innovation. And we talk a little bit about the use of technology readiness levels to implement this innovation. And then a little bit on the green technology and how to filter uh, uh, innovation uh, which came from uh, waste-derived materials. 
I hope I can I can do it within the uh, allocated time. Let's talk about the uh, sustainable uh, development goals. I think uh, probably uh, most of you uh, have already heard about uh, this term. This is the term that has been promoted by United Nations back in uh, 2015. Uh, there are goals to uh, promote sustainability, to improve uh, the livelihood of people, uh, reduce poverty, to uh, promoting uh, innovation technologies and activities which promote sustainability, protecting the environment, uh, facing the uh, challenges uh, with the uh, climate, uh, global warming, and reduce emission. We are not going to talk about these uh, 17 goals under uh, SDG goals. We will be focusing on infrastructure and innovation because that's what, what uh, I've been doing. So I'm just focused on infrastructure. It's particularly how the innovation in infrastructure uh, can help in uh, promoting uh, sustainability, helping uh, with uh, facing the uh, global warming, reduce emissions, and so on. When we talk about innovation, uh, often uh, we thought, okay, I've done something that is brilliant. This is something that exciting. It is a moment of pride. And I've got a promising future, a future to introduce my innovation to the market. But what we need to consider also where the, there are risks uh, associated with uh, this innovation. Is there any commercial or business uh, risk? as well as technological risk when implementing this innovation in the market. So we need to balance out between the, uh, uh, the, our interest in promoting this innovation and the, the, the risk associated with the process and implementation of this innovation. Um, there are market risks that need to be assessed, there are technological risks that need to be assessed and how the innovation can meet the competition against existing uh, products, materials, or any technologies uh, which are uh, established or already available in, in the market. So something that needs to be considered. So what I would like to do today is to share with you about the process, how we manage this risk. Let's talk a little bit about innovation. There are so many innovation, but I'll give you two examples. One, for example, developing smart materials. Uh, when we talk about uh, smart materials, this one example is a self-healing asphalt, materials that can heal itself uh, when uh, it became damaged. Um, there are a number of uh, ideas from uh, introduction of uh, steel wool fibers in the mix, which will heal the crack by heating up the element under induction, or another uh, uh, idea of using uh, oil or rejuvenating uh, agent into capsules, which will be blended into the mix. And that capsule can repair cracks when it contacts with uh, moisture or other external uh, uh, pressure. Then lately, we might have already heard about uh, nanotechnologies in materials. So nanomaterials being used, like for example, in this case, a graphene nano pellets as modifier for self-healing asphalt. So there are so many different ways in promoting innovation and those innovation they have been uh, developed in the laboratories and the, the concept has been proven by validation levels in lab scale and uh, field trial scale but where they are now they have not been fully adopted in the market so what are the challenges why the industry seems to be reluctant in immediately adopting this uh, a nice idea or innovations that are coming into the market. The next one is uh, an example of modular construction. This uh, show you about uh, a modular construction, how it develops from uh, a more conventional way. You have pre-stressed concrete as modular concrete to build uh, bridges or buildings or roads. But then more recently, there has been an idea to use more sustainable materials, recycled plastic, uh, as a block uh, uh, modular uh, paving construction to carry uh, cars, uh, pedestrian, or uh, as a cycle lanes. Then even uh, in the last, which, in, which incorporates uh, solar panels, 
on the surface of this modular construction. So there are innovation that's been uh, developed to promote one is sustainability using recycled materials and number two, trying to generate energy from uh, the infrastructure assets. And there are validation through these uh, trials on roads or on, on field sites, but why this innovation uh, appear to be uh, slowing down in terms of implementation? What are the challenges? This is just a summary of uh, the first step that we need to consider when it comes to implementing in innovation. One, one important aspect is we need to identify the gap. What are the, uh, uh, the gap that we need to fill in uh, in order for our innovation to be accepted, to be implemented uh, in the market or in larger scale application? There are a few things. One, obviously the, uh, the technical challenges, and the associated risk, whether our innovation is as durable, the quality is as good as their competitors. And also, more importantly, is about how you uh, manage this innovation. What would be the challenges with the health and safety and environment aspect during the production, installation, and service life of, of these uh, innovative ideas? And then we need to also do the end of life assessment. What we what we can be what we can do at the end of life of this asset when it is no longer used, can we use it for something else? And obviously, we need to do market assessment so that we know our innovation has got a market to go to. And what would be the commercial advantage against the competitors, against any existing uh, technology or any existing uh, materials products that which are already in the market. One uh, approach that has been used uh, quite widely uh, is the uh, uh, method using technology readiness level. In Indonesian, I think we, we might have heard the, the term tingkat kesiapan technology, which is more or less the same. This uh, idea is, is, is not a new idea. It's, it, it started back in 1970s. Uh, it was uh, developed by NASA when the, when they when they are assessing whether their uh, idea can be proven uh, on the smaller scale as, as to start with whether the concept can be validated in the smaller scale and then carrying out trial in the interim to see whether the uh, they can start uh, thinking about uh, applying the uh, the idea into a prototypes develop prototypes and up to production on the larger scale and up to launching the uh, uh, the rocket uh, in terms of this nasa development in 1970s but then this idea the main aim is to uh, one is to assess the degree of maturity whether the the technology is ready to be introduced uh, to a full scale production and uh, usage and also to enable discussion between parties uh, about these maturity levels. And this approach uh, subsequently has been adopted in other aspects of uh, the, uh, uh, well, not only for NASA, but already been adopted in, in the wider society. For example, uh, in uh, early 20, uh, 20, 2010, 2014, uh, in, in Europe, they started introducing the idea of technology readiness level in any uh, research uh, uh, activities, how to implement research into, into practices. And even uh, in, 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 during that period, uh, this uh, approach has been uh, standardized into ISO standard as well, ISO 16290. Uh, that explain about this uh, readiness level. But what I'm going to do today is to give you a flavor about how we implement this into our uh, research and how to use it uh, to promote our innovation. I give you two uh, example. One is uh, the case study if uh, our innovation is on the, uh, uh, on the industry or commerce uh, uh, side of the business. This uh, technology readiness level has got uh, nine levels. Uh, that levels, uh, uh, explains the level of maturities from uh, the low maturities to higher maturities. On initially, the innovators will need to establish 
that their uh, innovations are acceptable and valid uh, for implementation into larger scale. And then after that, uh, the industry might started uh, being interested in and having a discussion with the innovators and started introducing their innovation into the industry. This is how the risk is managed throughout the process. And this is how uh, the uh, an investor who are interested in this innovation can start thinking about, okay, I'm going to invest a little bit of funding here. And then when it is validated further, then I can spend more funding to develop this uh, product further until uh, the uh, full scale uh, introduction to the market where everybody can start thinking, okay, I've got, uh, I need more funding and I've got enough evidence to demonstrate that this innovation will work. So these are the advantages of uh, the, uh, the approach that everybody can have a common understanding how to approach this uh, technology status, the maturity level of this uh, technology and the risk management, how to manage the risk associated with the new innovation and how to use them to present evidence to get further funding to, uh, to promote the innovation to a larger scale application. This is on, on, the, on the commercial side. How about uh, when uh, using these methods on the publicly funded uh, projects? Uh, I give you an example, something that has been adopted here in England, uh, being promoted by Highways England, uh, which is the uh, uh, executive agents of the Department for Transport. I mentioned earlier there are nine maturity level on, on, on the technology readiness level from one to nine. And uh, this is about managing the risk. Initially, the responsibility would be with the innovator. And then when the technology has been proven further, uh, then they will start sharing the responsibility between innovator and the owner of the assets, whether it is the government or their uh, identified uh, management uh, body of the public assets. And then after the technology has been proven via demonstration, then the asset owner can take over this responsibility and develop the innovation further. I will give you a little bit more examples in the next few slides. Uh, this is the first uh, three levels of the maturity of, for this uh, technology readiness index. So basically, on the first three levels, the idea is how to prove your concept, uh, to validate the concept, to make sure all the uh, theoretical background, the laboratory analysis, or any uh, experimental uh, data, they will support uh, the innovation to move further to a larger uh, application. And that is the responsibility of the innovator. And then moving to the next level, the technology will start uh, to be validated. That will be validated in a small scale to start with, for example, in the laboratory uh, environment. And then after that, start uh, carrying out demonstration and validations on a larger scale, be it on a larger scale uh, at the laboratory or a larger scale on the networks on the road side. And then this uh, trial sections will be monitored over time and data will be gathered and then they will be assessed whether the technology or the innovation is ready to be used on, on the network. After that has been validated, the next level would be to uh, implement the prototype of the, in, uh, the innovations into the networks and then the, uh, the asset owner will start preparing the required documentation, the specification, the standard, and the way to monitor this uh, innovation. After a few years, then the innovation will have enough track record on, on the networks, then th that can be fully adopted widely, nationwide or beyond uh, the, uh, the area of, of the, uh, the, the initial trials. So that's how the seven to nine level uh, being implemented. I give you the real example from a project which I managed a few years ago. This is a collaborative research project whereby we need to uh, develop uh, a surfacing which will promote uh, longer life, good uh, drainage characteristic and low noise. And we need to start from, uh, from the scratch, from the white paper. 
So the work started by a more fundamental approach on, on the study and then followed by a workshop, a, a national workshop uh, whereby uh, experts being invited from the industry, from academia and from the government to explore options, to explore how we are going to approach these uh, requirements. And then after that, moving to a smaller scale trials in laboratories, trying to assess whether the concept, the design uh, is robust enough. After it is being proven in the laboratory scale, then we started doing a trial on the larger scale. And then after that, uh, started carrying out trial on the networks. And currently we are on the stage of uh, public uh, consultation whereby the, uh, uh, the, the new uh, materials has been considered as uh, suitable and being discussed about uh, whether this is ready for inclusion in national standard. As you can see here on the timeline, it takes uh, quite a long time from the concept to uh, the uh, stage where we are now. It's already six years and uh, the work is still ongoing. So innovation takes time. Hence, we need an approach that is uh, methodological so we can follow through all the results, all the difficulties and resolve them to improve our innovation to be ready for the next implementation level. Uh, we talk a little bit about green technologies. I'm not sure whether you have heard about green technologies. It is basically a technologies which promote uh, protection to the, our environment. Or so in some cases, it can repair any damage that has been done to the environment. So this is technology that helps in supporting a, a few of those uh, sustainability development goals. And there, there are a number of uh, technologies, but the principle of this green technology is to promote circular economy, uh, maximizing the value of the products from uh, the uh, extraction level, production and of life. And uh, as much as we can, can we reduce to avoid uh, new materials and using more recycling. And also there are uh, also challenges uh, whether we can use a process that is um, more uh, efficient in terms of using less energy and can reduce carbon uh, spending on, on the process. And when it comes to uh, achieving the end of life, can the, uh, the end of life materials being used again? How we can promote waste derived materials? So this is what I'm going to talk a little bit uh, is about waste derived materials. We have seen this being used somewhere, for example, as binder modifier in the use of crumb rubber tire from vehicles, from trucks, cars, or waste plastic, waste cooking oil, or as mist um, additive for the mixture. The, from the uh, power station, we've got uh, fly ash or furnace bottom ash, uh, or from uh, domestic incineration waste uh, that can be used as part of uh, the materials uh, production. And we can use uh, reclaimed materials for aggregate replacement, or we can produce new aggregates, artificial aggregate from waste derived materials, like uh, uh, from steel slugs, plus uh, furnace slugs, or non ferrous slugs, and even biopolymer has been promoted uh, in, in the last few years. The question here is how we manage uh, this material uh, to make sure we manage the risk associated with the use of these materials. The first item is similar with uh, how we deal with innovative materials. We need to check the track record uh, durability and any limitation and benefits using the, uh, uh, the things that I presented earlier with the technology readiness level and so on. But with the uh, waste derived materials, the additional requirement would be to check the environmental aspect of uh, the application or adoptions of these materials, whether there is any issue uh, that may damage uh, our environment any permitting issue, any licensing issue. One uh, to manage that is using a, a filtering protocol whereby we can filter any waste that being promoted as innovative materials and select which one applicable for our use. Uh, this is the work that we are uh, com completed uh, recently in developing filtering protocol, whereby the process is as we try to assess whether those kind of waste 
uh, can meet uh, the required uh, standard, be it from the environment standard or to the technical standard for the application. Um, so I'm going to do it very quickly now. The idea of the protocol is one is to check the compliance, whether the materials that are being promoted from waste product can potentially uh, be considered as appropriate for use in construction industry. And then if there are non-compliance, then we need to uh, identify what amendments required uh, in the process. Is there any issue on the health safety aspect? Is there any issue on the environmental aspect on the use of these materials? Is there any issue on the uh, end market, whether there is any market associated with uh, these new materials? We developed uh, the uh, flow chart uh, just to help uh, the user and the uh, innovators. Uh, the first part of the, uh, the flow chart is more about assessing the status of the proposed waste against the regulation, whether it is suitable to be processed as a, a end waste. So there are a number of process and cross check against a number of regulation and protocols that need to be satisfied. After the materials satisfy the, the requirement, it will go to the next process, otherwise it will stop. So that will, uh, will help us uh, to remove anything that is not suitable for the purpose of application in construction industry. And then the next phase would be start thinking about application in the uh, pavement specific uh, uh, industry application. So there are a few things that need to be considered. First is the supply chain uh, assessment, whether there's an issue on the handling, safety handling, environmental assessment, processing, how the processing will be done, and if there's any market. Once uh, those criteria has been satisfied, then it can go from this pavement industry specific assessments into demonstration of the end of waste uh, materials uh, into the tech, uh, readiness level. And then we move back to the uh, technology readiness level process, which I presented earlier. So that's, that's uh, what I would like to share with you today. Uh, so, uh, so hopefully you can see the, uh, the process from managing the risk in innovation, the use of technology readiness level, and then how to account for innovation which coming from uh, with derived materials, and then how to filter out uh, these materials in order to have something that is uh, suitable for our uh, infrastructure assets. So I hope that that is uh, useful and can be beneficial to everyone. If you are interested in more about the details which I presented today, there are some references here uh, that you can search in the internet or otherwise you can also contact me directly and I can send you, send you uh, this information. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll uh, pass on the, uh, the time and the flow back to uh, the moder moderator Ibututi. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Iswandaru. I think uh, Bututi is lost, uh, losing her connection. So, uh, participants, please hold your questions. Uh, you can ask uh, Dr. Iswandaru uh, your question after uh, Dr. Dewi's presentation. Okay, uh, Dr. Dewi, please uh, present. The screen is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, let me try. Uh, oh, okay. In here. Okay, so uh, can you all see my screen? Oh, okay, cool. So uh, let me. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, as what to be one of the speakers uh, in this forum. And uh, today uh, it's a bit different from Dr. Iswandaru maybe because of uh, I'm, I will talk about plasma, uh, especially in the plasma technology. Uh, so however, before we dig deeper into this, plasma staff, uh, please let me introduce myself. 
So my name is uh, Dewi. You can just call me Dewi. Uh, currently, I am working in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, uh, National Taiwan University of Science and Technology, Taiwan. Well, um, my research interest is obviously in the field of plasma for um, for the battery applications, uh, especially in the solid oxide fuel cells and uh, in semiconductors, because Taiwan, as we all know, Taiwan is the uh, biggest um, semiconductors um, providers. Uh, so I do, uh, we do soldering, encapsulation, decapsulation, tin whisker mitigation, and uh, other stuff about the, uh, such as variable and et cetera. And also uh, we deal with the, uh, uh, plasma for agricultural. The only interest, um, I love to eat just like uh, everyone else in this forum, I think. Uh, I really like to eat meat. Um, I love to play basketball and then I love, I love to go cycling, rock climbing, some other stuff. And uh, I'm a huge fan of Star Wars. So if any one of you is a, also a fan of Star Wars, please uh, hit me. Well, uh, I have uh, attended several workshops and conferences and uh, early, earlier last year uh, in March, I have visited uh, Universitas Pertamina in Jakarta. Okay, so um, let's start with the outline. So uh, the outline today will be, I will briefly introduce you all about plasma. What is it? Why can we see plasma? Where can we see plasma? And then how is it possible such a plasma works in an uh, atmospheric pressure? And obviously I will give thanks to you, uh, our collaborators. Okay, um, let's start with the plasma. Uh, what is plasma? This is, uh, I think I always ask everyone, what is plasma? Um, just imagine that you have a solid stuff and then you give the energy to the solid so it will melt and become liquid. You give more energy to this liquid, then it will uh, evaporate and become gas. Then you give sufficient energy to this gas, the atoms in this gas will be excited and uh, ga uh, gain more kinetic energy, dissociate it, recombine, and then finally it will be ionized to become the plasma. However, plasma itself is uh, not a fully ionized gas. This is only a partially ionized gas due to its quasi neutrality of particle charge. And plasma is often called as the uh, fourth state of matter. So uh, the reason why people call it plasma is not only because this is the fourth state of matter. So it was first coined by Irving Langmuir in 1928 and was uh, uh, patented a year after. It is more because of when he uh, he discovered that the shape of the uh, plasma at the time the name was not plasma yet. The name was still uh, uh, charged particle. So uh, Langmuir at the time discovered that the shape of the plasma is just like the blood plasma in our DNA, which is double helix. So he said, oh, this is like a, this is like the blood plasma. So I'm gonna name it plasma. Well, which is actually true. When I visited uh, the DNA museum in uh, Tübingen, uh, the shape is double helix and it's just like uh, the shape of the plasma. Anyways, um, as you could see over here, I show you that uh, the picture of the sun, I took it by myself in, Bali last year actually. So the reason why, because of the sun is one of the form of plasma. Why? Uh, in plasma is divided into two uh, forms, uh, in natural and also in technological. In nature, we could see plasma as the form of the sun, as the form of a turbolt, and also um, uh, and also uh, lightning. And uh, another one is Aurora, which is very, very beautiful. Uh, in technological, you see that if right now you're looking at your screen, your monitor, this is actually made of plasma. Uh, your chips in your phone, this is actually made of plasma. Uh, the light bulbs actually made of plasma. So where can we see plasma? Actually, we already see plasma. So plasma is actually everywhere. Um, talking about the plasma itself, uh, 
what plasma technology can do. So it actually could do anything. For example, in the material side, we could do the surface treatment, materials coating, selective cleaning, etching uh, for ICs packaging in semiconductors for battery, for agricultural. So as a plasma scientist, I myself is a plasma scientist. Uh, this is what we need to cover. So this is what my team is dealing with you, the surface treatment, with you, the etching and use the And then um, after that, actually, um, we will go to the plasma technology. So uh, when we talk about the plasma technology, people will think it as the vacuum plasma, or people will think it as the space plasma, or people will think it as the thermal plasma, which is very hot because of you see the sun, the sun is very hot. Or when we talk about the vacuum plasma, then uh, the pressure is very low. But uh, all of the plasma technology it could do a good deposition process, or it could do a good uh, etching process. However, for example, for the vacuum, uh, the vacuum plasma itself, it needs a uh, vacuum system, which is a very huge one or, or very, and it will occupy space. And for the vacuum system itself, we need to pump it down to 10 to the power of four, minus four or minus five tor which means that we need to wait for uh, an hour or two hours until it pumps down to that specific pressure, then we do the processing. So it is one of the uh, disadvantages of faking plasma. Therefore, we try to uh, use the uh, plasma in an ambient pressure, which is what we call the atmospheric pressure plasma. So uh, atmospheric pressure plasma itself some people also call it as the uh, thermalist reactor. So uh, like I've mentioned earlier that uh, plasma could do surface modification, deposition, surface treatment in etc. So uh, for the thermalist reactor or the uh, atmospheric pressure plasma, it could, go, it could also do the surface modification without modifying the bulk materials. Uh, it could do the deposition, for example, if you want to add layer by layer or do the coating, it could do that. It, it could also do the iron bombardment for sputtering and etching for selective cleaning and etc. in ICs packaging or in semiconductors. However, how is it possible? Well, uh, plasma itself is generating and is generated by what we call the reactive plasma species. So it's a it's a fundamentally that we have to know plasma will produce what we call the uh, reactive species, such as the, uh, we know hydrogen peroxide, ozone, hydroxyl, nitric, acid, nitric oxide. Uh, other people or other, well, other people will say that, oh, ozone is not good, ozone is harmful, or hydrogen peroxide is also harmful. Uh, however, actually, from the plasma uh, product, those are not harmful. We, we do know that uh, hydrogen peroxide is a good bleaching agent, which is good for the cleaning. Ozone could kill bacteria. Hydroxyl is also uh, good for the wetting. Anyways, uh, we, will talk a bit, uh, we will talk again about the reactive species later on. Um, also, plasma is generated by and generating uh, ions and electrons, and also the UV radiation the heat and the visible light. So here, I mentioned here the visible light. Um, since plasma is actually formed by the ions and electrons and, and charged particles, uh, reactive species, so we could never ever see the plasma. Imagine the electrons, um, the electrons um, diameter is very, very small. Means that plasma, we could never see plasma using our naked eyes. So the light that we see from the plasma is actually emitted by the photon particles. And this is what we call as a visible light. So uh, for example, the fluorescent lights or the light bulbs that we see, it's actually what we call as the visible light. Plasma is also uh, generating the electromagnetic field. Uh, the electromagnetic field from the plasma is very strong, but we also need this EMF to produce the plasma. And uh, Talking about the plasma, there are three regions of plasma system. So for example, this is, a, this is a real atmospheric pressure plasma system in our lab. Uh, over here, I will try to 
a bit described that this is our, what we call the plasma body. This is where the electrode and the gas is fed in. And this is the uh, uh, plasma head. And this side, this is what we call the dark region. So in the dark region, this is where um, the homogeneous reaction happen, which means that the dissociation process happen. And finally, we produce what we call the uh, reactive, plasma reactive species. And finally, this plasma reactive species will be exiting uh, the, uh, the nozzle to the environment, which is what we call the glow region. Over here, this is, uh, I hope that you could see it clearly that it is glowing uh, in the uh, purple, um, uh, in the purple, uh, in the purple light like this. So this is, this is a very stable plasma state. And after that, it will go to the arc region of which that we could see the oxygen, the nitrogen, the ox uh, oxide uh, radical species, hydroxyl, and then the ozone species and other uh, plasma reactive species. So the question is, how could we observe these radical species? Um, for the atmospheric pressure plasma system, it's very unique. Maybe for the vacuum plasma, uh, we could use uh, some props, for example, like Langmuir props, but for atmospheric pressure plasma, we could never use that because it is working in an ambient pressure. So we are using uh, optical emission spectroscope, which give our signal like this, as we, you could see over here. So plasma uh, need to have, uh, plasma need to have uh, gas sources. We could use the nitrogen, we could use the air, which is actually, uh, CDA or the compressed dry air, and also the H2O vapor, this is the water vapor. And then even though it is work in an ambient pressure, we could also mix the hydrogen with the nitrogen, but not the pure hydrogen because of last year, actually our lab just last year or two years ago, uh, we just had an accident because of the hydrogen blow up in our lab. Anyways, um, let's move on to this uh, plasma stuff. Then, one of the application that we have established in this past uh, three to four years is in the semiconductors. So in the semi semiconductors, we do know uh, about the integrated circuits. So integrated circuits is actually a uh, small electronic uh, devices that is placed in the small piece of what we call as the chip. So it is very, very tiny. And uh, this chip is usually in the fab, we call it as the, uh, uh, unit. So uh, this chip needs to be integrated with the uh, with the PCB or printed circuit boards. If you have PC, uh, you do you must know the motherboard. So it's actually what we call the PCB. So how to integrate this chip with the PCB is using uh, technology that we call as the uh, soldering. This is a soldering uh, process. This is an actual soldering process, not like the soldering, soldering that we all know using our hand. No, this is using an oven. So we call this the solder reflow process. As you could see over here, there are three solder bolts that is, uh, that, is that are mounted on the solder pad. So this tiny little thing, the orange one over here, this is what we call the solder pad. There are a lot of uh, packaging processes. And one of those is what we call the flip chip. So, our uh, flip is very, very widely uh, used in the semiconductors or in the packaging process. Uh, however, it has, it will go through two level packaging. The first one is what we call as the first level packaging. So uh, before it becomes a chip, then we need to have the backend process and the uh, front end process. So our case is always in the uh, backend process. So in the backend process, we need to sew the dye, which is the silicon dye. And this silicon dye needs to be integrated with the substrate. And this substrate is uh, made by a copper uh, with a solder resist on the top of it, like this one, the, uh, the green one. This is the, just an illustration. And uh, usually on the top of the substrate, on the top of the uh, uh, die or PCB, we will see the solder pad. This is where the solder should be mounted or placed. So this is what we call, uh, why is it called a flip chip? Because of uh, the die will be flipped. So this is why this is called a flip chip. 
And then after that, we will go for the reflow soldering. And after the first level packaging, then we go to the second level packaging where the, where the uh, unit will be integrated with the PCB. And this also need to use the reflow soldering process afterwards. So after that, uh, we need to, I'm not sure if any of you ever seen the, uh, uh, the real IC chips before. Uh, anyways, uh, after the reflow soldering, we need to go through to the wire bonding process. And then after that, we do the, uh, uh, what we call the uh, a mold compound process. So this mold compound is usually like this. So it's actually black one. So this is polymer. And this is what we also do. And this is what we call the decapsulation process. And uh, this one, uh, before this happening, actually before the salt reflow uh, process, all of the substrate surface or the PCB surface, we need to clean it. So this is what we call the surface cleaning and conventionally, this is using the acid-based solution, which is uh, the, uh, the waste solution usually will be through to the environmental. So in the, in the environment, so it is not environmentally friendly. Therefore, we try to, uh, we try to change this uh, surface cleaning process with the atmospheric pressure plasma surface cleaning. Um, as you could see over here, uh, I could try to play the video. So it's only very, very uh, fast, very, very in a short time. So only 0 0.5 seconds. And then uh, how, how is the, uh, res how does the re result? The result is very, very good actually. Uh, which is very clean. And then uh, as you could see, uh, let me try to... So these three are our substrate and we try to clean it using the atmospheric pressure plasma uh, of which using uh, various gas sources such as the nitrogen, over here, nitrogen, air, H2O vapor, just like I have mentioned earlier. And then for the soldering process itself, uh, we got supported by Nanya, which is our call, our subset of vendor. And then in the soldering, uh, what we need to understand more is the uh, uh, spreading ratio of which that when the spreading ratio is high, then the water value should be high. Then we also need to understand the reliability control in this moment, at this moment, uh, this is where the ball sharing process. So all of these uh, tasks what we call the reliability test. Uh, we are following the ASTM standard and also the GTEx standard. So the results actually like this. For the solder spreading ratio, uh, we could see for, uh, for the samples without any plasma treatment. This is in the yellow bar chart over here. Um, the spreading ratio is always lower than uh, the samples after the plasma treatment. And then we try to confirm it using uh, the uh, ball sharing process. This is, uh, this is the uh, ball sharing process results. Uh, so as we could see, the pristine means the no plasma treatment. And then we see that the shear strain is higher after the plasma treatment. And then this means that uh, in the material, uh, mechanics of materials, we always know that we always have uh, three breaking modes, the uh, ductile, the semi-ductile, and the uh, uh, brittle. Um, so if this is ductile, which means that the shear is, uh, is good, the shear strength is good. So we try to, to observe it using the FESM or this uh, electron microscope. And we could see that uh, most of the solder uh, ball is in the ductile breaking mode. And then this process actually have uh, this process has been uh, internally patented by Bosch. This is uh, actually our uh, our um, our research, uh, dev our research and development uh, with Bosch, uh, Bosch Germany. And then we also know in the semi in semiconductors industries, uh, the unit or the chip is very very small. And sometimes we also want to know to, we also want to clean some part of it. 
which is in submillimicron size. So we also deal with what we call the selective cleaning. And we try to use the atmospheric plasma treatment to clean this area. So for example, here, this is uh, what we call as the plasma indicator. Uh, this is the pristine one, which is, uh, this is the polymer. So this is uh, using the plasma called it. So we call the polymer uh, using the plasma. And then we want to clean some part of areas. So this is what we. This is why we call it a selective cleaning. And then uh, we have several diameters. For example, 0 0.5 millimeter, 1.5, and 2 millimeter. And we see uh, that we could do the selective cleaning. So this is also uh, the video of how to do this selective cleaning. So we only scan it. We only scan it several times, actually. And the results will be like this. Uh, this is, we before we understand more uh, of this surface cleaning process, we need to understand also how to define the good surface cleaning process. So first is that high throughput process and then high cleaning rate ratio, cleaning uniformity, and then uh, obviously uh, green technology that is uh, environmentally friendly and then negligible of materials defect. Number five and number four are very important in this process. So we, we could understand that actually FEP process or atmospheric pressure plasma process could satisfy the good surface cleaning criterion. And uh, this is what I meant actually. So uh, number five over here that we see negligible of materials defect. So when we are using the atmospheric pressure plasma for this selective cleaning, we need to understand how to adjust a good parameter. So we have several working distance. Working distance means that the uh, Z axis between the uh, surface uh, of the substrate, uh, from the surface of the subject to the tip of the nozzle. If we could see over here, if we, uh, if, the, uh, if the working distance is too short, then we will have uh, the over edge or the over cleaned area over here. And then if the, um, uh, the working distance is too high, then there won't be any uh, very huge cleaning uh, area, which is only pressure clean area. So we, un we could understand here that uh, good or the optimal working distance is at 12 millimeter working distance. And we could see this is clean. And after this, we move on to the scanning times effect. And using this 12, 12 millimeter working distance, we try to find out what is the best or the optimum um, scanning times. So we try from the 5, 10, 15, 20 until 25. We see if the scanning time is too short, then there won't be any, uh, we couldn't see any fully cleaning area. Of which that 15, we could see the clean. However, uh, from, the, uh, from this um, bar chart, it's not that sufficient enough. So we try to go for 20 scan times and we could see that this is a good cleaning one. And 25 is also the same. However, uh, we, we get our conclusion that we will use 12 millimeter working distance with 20 scanning times. Why? We, why? Because of um, just if we could already get the results, which is uh, the selective cleaning with uh, after 20 uh, scanning times, why should we bother ourselves to, uh, to, to, to longer the time? So we just try to uh, shorten the time to, because, to have the 20 scanning times. So that is the reason why. And then not only that, in our, uh, in our research group, we also collaborate with a battery, uh, with a solid oxide fuel cells, uh, fender or company, local company actually. So we try to develop our solid oxide fuel cells, which is the batch three. So uh, for this one, just imagine that you have a hot dog and this hot dog has uh, two, uh, well, two layers of bread. Obviously in the middle is the sausage. So the top and the bottom are the, uh, the top and the bottom breads are the uh, electrode, which are uh, cathode and anode, and the sausage is the uh, solid electrolyte. So uh, this is this is the schematic uh, 
this is the semantic of the solid oxide fuel cells. Yes, this is a battery and work in an electrochemical manner. However, this is not uh, only could produce the, uh, the power, but also could uh, store the power. Anyways, uh, how do we done it? So we tried to use the atmospheric pressure plasma, but this time, uh, if you see from the, uh, if you see from for the semiconductor process, we are using the uh, rotating hat. As you could see, this is rotating. However, for the plasma coating, we are using the fixed one, which means that the way we do this, uh, the scanning, uh, we the way we do the coating is using the uh, uh, fixed uh, uh, fixed hat. Of which definitely the temperature is higher than the rotating one uh, due to the uh, angular momentum low. Anyways, we, uh, we do know that using this uh, method, uh, we could achieve uh, the unary, the binary, and also the ternary uh, ceramics. For example, like the ternary is the uh, lanthanum strontium manganese. So this is for the cathode. So for this one, this is usually for, uh, this is zirconia oxide, this is nanoparticle. Uh, it's around uh, 20, 10 to 20 nanometer. And uh, this is for the solid electrolyte. And the inner layer, this is the barrier between the cathode and the electrolyte. And this is uh, should be dense, a bit dense like this. And then uh, for the cathode, it must be porous. So we have achieved those. We also have achieved the uh, the uh, the quaternary, which is the uh, four different chemicals, and we try to call it to become one ceramics, which is the uh, lanthanum, strontium, cobalted iron. And also uh, recently, we uh, we also produce uh, the metal, which is the uh, silver, and also uh, copper using this, uh, our, met our method. And uh, uh, we just made a commercial one for the solid oxide fuel cells and still ongoing, this is still an ongoing uh, pro uh, project. So for example, as we know that for the, uh, this is the carbon paper, uh, as we know that the temperature is a bit high, D depends, actually depends on the gas, uh, gas sources, however, uh, we could achieve a quite low temperature, which is around uh, 270 something. And uh, as we see over here, one company asked us to have to use the carbon paper as the electrolyte and asked us to uh, make the stacks for the cathode materials. And this is already for this one, for this, uh, for this one has been uh, commercialized. And recently we are still developing this uh, technology for uh, the stack. So maybe for uh, Dr. Iwa Iswan, there earlier mentioned about the, uh, um, the solar panels. So this one, we could make it into the stacks using this, uh, using this uh, technique actually. So would you, <clears throat> so the company will give us the um, materials, which is the, uh, uh, the real uh, electrolyte, solid electrolyte. And we just try to, uh, coat the cathode and then stack again with the internal layer and then coat again with the uh, um, with the uh, uh, with the um, uh, the electrolyte and the internal layer and then the uh, cathode and then obviously anode for the uh, Ni or nickel oxide and then uh, not only that actually uh, our system could also do the seed germination and the plant growth of which that. Uh, this is for the agricultural, and this is still ongoing. And we found out that with a suitable uh, parameter adjustment, we could grow the, this is the uh, time-lapse camera. We could grow the, uh, the plant. We have the mung bean, cucumber, and tomato. We could grow it uh, inside and outside the room. It is more because of uh, the plasma we will produce nitrogen and potassium to germinate it. And uh, we are still working on this, but recently uh, we just won a competition, a kind of like an awards for this agricultural stuff. And uh, we are planning, uh, not planning, actually, we are recently uh, dealing with the greenhouse for this uh, seed germination. 
anyways, uh, when we talk about the plasma, we could also try to make what we call the uh, dancing plasma specificor. This is uh, uh, this is the uh, the exciting one from 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 our research group. That as you could see here, the name is the dancing plasma speaker. You might be wondering why. So um, let me show you this one. So this is our, this is the circuit, and we try to produce the plasma speaker uh, using these circuits and this. Uh, arc discharge. This is what we call the plasma. So this arc discharge is um, actually a bit like a, I call it dancing plasma because of this arc discharge is moving in, in, in an accordance to the uh, frequency uh, that is produced by the speaker and the speaker is actually produced by the plasma itself. Anyways, uh, for this one, we also won uh, that competition and uh, one company asked us to uh, commercially produce this plasma speaker. And not only that, uh, we in the semiconductors, we could also do the etching. So in the earlier, I mentioned that after the soldering process and then the wire bonding process, and then we do the encapsulation or the mold compound process. So usually in the semiconductors, um, if we have the waste one, which is the program, so in the, in the semiconductors, we have the MEMS and the ASIC, which is that uh, sometimes after several tests, uh, the program, uh, what we call the OTP, the program will be damaged because of due to the environment and etc. So they do, not, we, they do not want to waste it. So we do the decapsulation, which is the etching like this. So this is the chip. The reason why is because we want to add the mold compound and we recycle the MEMS and the ASICs. So the chip or the dye will not be wasted anymore. So this is kind of like uh, uh, kind of like recycling uh, product. And uh, this is also, uh, we are developing it recently. And, uh, uh, I, and my summary is that I just want to let you know, as a person uh, of the from the uh, plasma enthusiast, I just want to say that plasma is everywhere. We are surrounded by plasma, and yes, uh, it is feasible to use plasma in an ambient pressure. And the, I just want to say uh, this is these are our collaborators, and obviously, I want to say thank you to our plasma team. And uh, uh, recently, uh, my team. Uh, we just developed the uh, YouTube channel for our research uh, uh, for our research group, and then that's all from me today. If you have any questions regarding plasma, please uh, hit me on, and I will be very happy to answer it uh, since this is my passion. So, just last one, just last Whoa. one, last video for you all that we could touch Whoa. plasma because actually it is not. Uh, it's not in a high temperature. And please do not try this at home because of uh, the high power. And that's all from me today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Devi. Okay, um, give applause for both speakers. Hello. Hello. Yeah, is my voice can be heard? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, big applause for our both speakers. So enlightening and um, yeah, so much material. Or uh, I I heard echo in my device. Is everything all right? Yes. Yeah, clear here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Iswandaru and Dr. Dewi. Um, okay. Uh, very well, ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to a question and answer session. So there will be, I think um, I will open uh, as one, the first session for three questions. And um, you can open your uh, speaker yeah to ask directly or you can write 
in uh, chat. Um, so mention your name and from which department are you from? So is there anyone? Yeah. Okay. Oh, while waiting for waiting for the uh, question, I'd like to ask to this one there first. Um, so you started the uh, research about pavement and concrete uh, in 2000. Let me sorry, uh, 2015. The readiness level of technology. To, to break in 2019. So is that... Dr. Eswan can you hear me? Uh, yes, I just I couldn't hear the last bit of your sentence. I think your voice oh, okay. was, was missing. Okay, okay, so I, I will repeat it. So you started the, the, the research about pavement and concrete from, uh, I mean, 2015, and then you reached the level of technology readiness mm -hmm. to, to seven grade in 2019. Is that correct, sir? Um, well, uh, yes, but uh, there are, um, well, for this part, Particular example, uh, mm. the project started in 2015, and then we need to go through uh, the levels uh, bit by bit. So we started from level one, two on the first two years, and then uh, once we validate everything, everything's approved and acceptable, then we can move to the next level. Then we reach a uh, level around level eight, seven, eight after five, uh, six years. So it takes a while in order to uh, to prove our concept, mm. produce a prototype, uh, validate, monitor, and test uh, during these uh, different levels of readiness. So that's how we manage the uh, the process and the risk from uh, introducing these innovations. Because otherwise, uh, if we don't uh, do it in stages, what well, the the biggest risk is something that is not ready to be uh, adopted widely being marketed and then we found that oh there's any issue and that risk if it is just financial risk uh, everybody can recover but if it is loss of life and any bigger risk then that would be problematic this way we can manage those risk in the same way as what we have seen nowadays, uh, I, I know in, uh, in in the introduction, uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Budi said that uh, we've been talking a lot about COVID, but the way the vaccine was has been developed to address the COVID issue also follow similar principle. I.e., you will you will go through uh, the uh, innovation, proving the concept, and then the first trial and then the, the next larger trial and then the third uh, full-scale trials and then the vaccine can be administered to to everyone so this more or less the same process what i was trying to say here is the process can be quite lengthy it can be as long as uh, the one i presented uh, six years or it can be as quickly as what we have seen with the development of covid 19 vaccine which is just within two years, you've got the vaccine. So that's 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 the uh, the variables that we need to account for when we want to introduce an innovative uh, technologies, materials, or products. Okay, thank you, sir. I hope that so, answers your mean, question. So I mean, if we relate the <laughs> uh, with the um, the situation uh, about applying a technology, a technology, a new technologies in Asia. Sorry, I think yeah. I have double speaker here. It's okay, I can I can hear so, you. Yeah. Okay. So I mean we have problem like, like applying a new technology in Indonesia. Like so um, in university we have like you know every every semester after 
uh, we have new technology. I mean, not not real technology. I mean, new innovation. But rarely we can implement it and reach our you know readiness level to seven, eight, or even higher. So what? So for Indonesian current situation, what? Where do you think we should start from? I mean, after we have been uh, you know innovation in lab. Then afterwards, what 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 should we do then? Yes. Uh, well, you you can uh, follow the uh, principle of readiness level. I suppose the uh, the uh, the main question uh, should be uh, well. We should ask ourselves in terms of when when we want to uh, uh, to develop a, a product or an innovation, then we need to ask ourselves what would be the aim for this innovation? Because that will dictate uh, or direct us towards which level of readiness we want to achieve. Uh, okay. For example, uh, on, in, in, in most cases at the, at the university, you, you, you might want to consider, okay, I want to achieve up to readiness level three or four, mm -hmm. which means uh, the concept is developed. There is a scientific background to support the concept, uh, validation in uh, in laboratory scale, mm -hmm. and a little bit more validations on on slightly larger scale. And you've got a concept that has been proven to a uh, limited validation level. And during the process, uh, because it's, it's all depend on which industry we are in. In the academia, perhaps uh, what you would like to to achieve is to, to develop the knowledge. So you find new knowledge, uh, uh, formulated a new idea, presented as a, either a patent or publications and things like that. So that's probably uh, one of the goal. But if you want to develop it further, then during that process, once you reach a certain level, let's say TRL3, start making like a, a projection, the roadmap, for your innovative products, what you, how you would like to develop it into a market scale product. Once you've got the, uh, the roadmap for the next, let's say five years, then you scale it into uh, uh, stages. Uh, first is need to start uh, looking uh, into parties who are the parties who are interested in using the product. So for example, inviting investor from outside or partner from outside to develop it further. Uh, you may need some more funding. So that's how you, the investor or other parties may, may come in if funding uh, can be an issue or would be required. Then you will validate that. After uh, you reach a certain level that the product is proven, then move to the next level, perhaps limited distribution. Once it is a uh, widely proven, then uh, you can introduce it to the market and check the market whether the market is is, is happy and the products can develop further. So that's yeah. that's the process. So I think we need to set ourselves a goal, which level we want to achieve. So that's how we, we manage it. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a big task for us. Uh, you know, researcher and lecturer in Indonesia to do, uh, you know, such such uh, big job. Or perhaps, Hopefully if, you, with... if you have, a, for example, final year student, uh, then maybe you can make like a blueprint in terms of uh, what you try to develop, and then you you slice them into stages. For example, mm -hmm. for this year's the student will will try to achieve this mm -hmm. level. And then they finish with uh, their dissertation, and then for the next year, different student will will do the work. But it's not it's not going to be a repeat of what has been done, but can continue. So that's how yes. you slice it yes. into oh. the next level. Thank you for the good idea, sir. <laughs> okay, um, uh, we have a question, and I think uh, this is for uh, both uh, speakers. Uh, from Dea Asnali, yeah, uh, that was an insightful presentation, Dr. Iswandaro and Dr. Dewi. I would like to ask, how can the green technologies can change the world to a better place, in your opinion? So, 
Maybe we start from Dr. Iswan Warren first, and then we go to Dr. Uh, Devi, please. Uh, thank you. It's a very good uh, question. Um, as per the definitions of uh, green technology, uh, which I presented earlier, it is any technologies, any development, which can help protecting uh, the environment, which is something that is sustainable, technology yang berkesinambungan, yang ramah lingkungan. Uh, of course, it will change the world to a better place simply because one reason, uh, this will uh, force us or encourage us to use a technology which will not damage our environment. So, sesuatu yang bisa membantu me melindungi lingkungan kita, uh, baik uh, dengan mengurangi penggunaan bahan baku mineral uh, dari bumi, uh, for example, atau mengurangi emisi, atau mengurangi penggunaan uh, energi yang berasal dari minyak bumi, misalnya. Uh, atau mengencourage teknologi untuk um, apa, menciptakan energi yang uh, renewable, apakah uh, tadi disebutkan uh, solar panel, ataukah dari angin, dan seterusnya. Nah, itu membantu kita untuk menjaga lingkungan kita. Kalau lingkungan kita bersih, udara kita bersih, kemudian uh, natural resources itu terjaga, itu membantu anak uh, cucu kita yang akan yang akan datang untuk bisa memanfaatkannya. Demikian juga uh, dengan apa teknologi yang uh, renewable itu juga sangat membantu untuk apa uh, dari sisi visual kita banyak melihat uh, uh, misalnya dibandingkan dengan situasi di mana kita ada di kota sedikit tumbuh-tumbuhan. Kalau kita menggunakan uh, approach yang lebih sustainable, ramah lingkungan, lebih dekat dengan lingkungan, maka uh, di pandangan mata saja itu sudah sudah enak. Kalau kita lihat kota-kota yang uh, mempromosikan apa uh, keramahan lingkungan, itu kita lihat di mata itu jauh lebih enak. Kita lihat kota besar dengan suasana pedesaan, mana yang lebih enak? atau kesegaran udaranya mana yang lebih enak itu itu aja dari eh, dari saya jadi eh, tentu akan banyak eh, apa eh, manfaat eh, untuk membuat dunia kita menjadi lebih lebih baik thank you dr Iswander um, dr Dewi I would like to give you a chance dr Dewi Ya, yeah, halo. Ya. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So, mm -hmm. I mean related with your I mean can the or related and also with the green technologies can we use it to have uh, you know to change the world or uh, give a, a better uh, life lifestyle maybe to to the people who use it. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's a, it's a good question. It's a very good question actually, and uh, I agree with what Dr. Xwanderu uh, 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 mentioned earlier that uh, obviously uh, one of the fr fr from my side uh, as a person uh, dealing with the uh, green, green technology, of uh, I will say that um, even though. Um, First of all, we might we 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 might from my own opinion we couldn't uh, we could change the world in a better place, but little by little, by um, for example changing our habit, for example like that from the green technology point of view, uh, for example uh, in in our case. We always try to uh, to to do the recycle. For example, like I've mentioned earlier about the uh, um, about the the chip. We do know that the chip, after several uh, after several tests, we do know it will fail. However, we will not just like uh, throw it in a dustbin, something like that. It's not like that. So we try to re we try to find uh, the we try to find the way uh, to 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 recycle it. So it's kind of like a circle one, circle one. And then for example, we, we try to use the ozone or, 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 or uh, 
to 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 make it from the negative stuff to become post more positive stuff for example like that and obviously um however when we are talking about solar cells when we're talking about the wind technology or we when we're talking about the uh hydro uh, micro hydro stuff something like that um i agree with uh dr is wonder when mentioning that um uh the the the, the air the environment will be more friendly to us if we are friendly to the environment itself. However, there is a case in, 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 in Taiwan itself, actually. Um, in the northern Taiwan, uh, they try to uh, use uh, or build up uh, the wind, uh, the, uh, the, wind um, the wind power. However, uh, they also harming uh, the other environment. Yes, they said, oh, this is green technology. But we need also to understand that when we are talking about the green technology, we could, we could, we have to uh, think about the surrounding environment. Will it be more harmful or more efficient? Will it be more harmful or will, 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 because of at the time, uh, I went to that place actually, and then they tried to, uh, it is surrounded by dolphins. Which is actually the wind of the wind frequency will be more harmful to uh, the dolphin. So this kind of uh, this kind of uh, mind that we need to also change ourselves. That yes, we do the green technology, but we also need to understand will it be more harmful or not harmful, something like this. So hopefully you could understand what I'm trying to uh, mention in here. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mary. Okay, so we have, uh, I think, three or four uh, questions. So let's try to the question. Um, from, uh, the, from Rayhan Rifki Ihsan, thank you for the insightful presentation. My question is, are there any threat of in using plasma technology compared with conventional technology? For example, in IC fabrication, how is it going with compete uh, with the current technology as uh, that, as we all know, already quite reliable? And, and last, can we actually fully use green energy in the future, considering business aspect? Because from what I see right now, it looks like a quite expensive and not really practical to apply. Thank you. So I think this question goes to Dr. Dewi. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the, the, the first sentence? The, uh, the first are part. there any threat of in using plasma technology com compared with conventional ones? Okay, so um, are there any threat of? Yes, obviously there is a threat of. Every technology will have threat of. I'm not gonna... Uh, mentioned that our technology is the uh, most successful one, no. Um, the threat of is obviously the cost, the place, because of when we are using the conventional one, we only need to use the film hood and we only need to, because the conventional one is the, uh, uh, the uh, chemicals based. However, when we try to invest something that could uh, better, uh, bet will be better in the future. We always try to invest uh, first. So usually it will go to the cost and the place. If if that could uh, answer this question. And what what was the next one? Um. Wait. Uh. Track of how is it going with the current technology? Compete with current technology. How is it going? Um, I mean, how how ready is the plasma technology can be applied? For the vacuum technology, uh, it is actually more than decades. For the vacuum plasma, it's more than decades. So it's very mature one. However, like I've mentioned earlier, the disadvantage is more that we need to pump down the uh, vacuum system itself. To, and we need sometimes for it, for example, uh, your, your phone is actually made of plasma technology and it was still vacuum technology. And now the ISIS, the, the, the industrials will try to change little by little to the atmospheric uh, plasma due to that 
due to that uh, due to that longer uh, processing uh, process. Yeah. Okay. So it is. It, so so the answer is ready. It is ready already. It is ready. And okay. for the atmospheric pressure plasma itself, like I've mentioned. Uh, because uh, I, I could say I, now I could say because of it's been uh, it's been patented so by by Bosch so we it is ready because of we already use it. Okay, and I think the the last question is from Raihan is uh, can we actually use uh, fully uh, green energy in the future? Uh, for me or for Dr. Iswander? Uh, I think it's, it's still for your question. Oh, for me, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, are we, uh, are we, are we, <laughs> sorry? Can we use? Can we fully use the, the green energy in the in the, in the future? Um, I'm a positive person and a very optimistic person, so I will say yes, and we have to be ready. Yes, and we have to be ready, and we have to be ready to fully use all of the green technology, of which that. Right now, we already do it little by little, just like what uh, Dr. Iswander mentioned that little by little, and then uh, make it into like uh, the roadmap. And this is already a good way. And I'm very optimistic, maybe 100 years, 50 years uh, later, uh, we have to be ready for that. Yeah. yeah, yeah can yeah. I add one on, on that? Yeah. Uh, just uh, Please, from... Uh, from the uh, the community uh, or, or the uh, the national uh, level uh, consideration, uh, fully agree with the statement or the answer uh, that uh, the green technology uh, is uh, is growing and growing and it is the future. Uh, even officially, uh, governments. Uh, uh, has already signed up to it. Uh, many governments already signed up the uh, Paris Agreement or Bali Agreements to promote uh, more sustainable uh, uh, activities, including uh, green technologies. Um, very recently, uh, the UK government has they they announced that in the next decade, by 2030, there will be no more uh, fuel-based vehicles. So no more petrol, no more diesel. Uh, base vehicle, new vehicles, these new vehicles will be av available in the market or will be approved to be in the market. So everybody is moving towards uh, more electric types uh, generated from either solar panel. There are pro and cons on the uh, solar panel, wind energy, uh, uh, green nuclear energy and other stuff. But we are moving that way. We're staying away from uh, crude oil based uh, uh, exploration uh, or generation of, of energy. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Dewi. Well, it's, uh, yeah, I think uh, the electric car is already available in the market. So I think everybody can buy it. And, and not very long the from now. One. Yeah, not, not very long from now. So probably a, a, qu a quarter from our society will have electric car. So, okay, thank you so much. Uh, next, we, uh, for the next question came from uh, Dr. Rafi. Um, I have a question for Dr. Dewi. It is well known that plasma is used in vacuum to prevent involvement of other gases, which is may introduce adverse effect. How did the ambient, uh, ambient condition affects your system? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's also a good question. Uh, for the CMOS, uh, CMOS is actually metal oxide semiconductors. Uh, to be honest, uh, I'm not sure for that device yet because uh, for the silicon, uh, it's definitely different from what I have uh, done, uh, what uh, my, what my, our team have done because of in our case, uh, we only deal with the uh, uh, we only deal with the uh, soldering, encapsulation, and decapsulation. We are not dealing with the CMOS yet. <laughs> with that, uh, if you're if you're if you're 
maybe it could help you more when um so yes for for ximos uh it, any impurity uh we have to neglect it so in the ambient pressure definitely we need to this is the big concern this is why we also have uh we also need to understand what is our uh objective if our aim is to deal with impurities definitely we need to use uh different gas sources for example uh, argon mixed with the uh hydrogen or nitrogen mixed with the hydrogen the reason is because of those are the uh, uh reduction process or it will reduce the impurities. But since we already have the ozone uh, as the one of the products of the plasma, then in, in our case, uh, from our data uh, recently, definitely we could we could uh, we could reduce those impurities. But uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I have to ask a question to uh, the person who is asking me question. Uh, what kind of impurities that you're asking? Are you asking about the carbon contamination? Are you asking about the oxide contamination or what? Because of in our case, if you're talking about the carbon contamination, this we have been done and we do know that we could reduce it. Um, and to be honest, vacuum plasma is not, uh, uh, sorry, and to be honest, atmospheric pressure plasma is more, it's cheaper than the vacuum plasma. And if you're talking about the oxide, this is what we are dealing. Um, in our case, we are creating more oxide. You must be like, uh, oh, why, why? Something like that. But uh, it's more because of, uh, for example, in Eximos, or we do know that copper has a native oxide. And the oxide is just like an island. So it's just like uh, dot, dot, dot. But using the plasma, we are creating more oxide of which that uh, the oxide will be penetrated because of the ROS or the reactive species. So it will be more planar and it will be easier for, for us to, be, to go to the next one to reduce this oxide because it is more uniform oxide than we just clutch, uh, just remove it like that. Yeah, I hope that it could answer the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, it's another perspective about using, I'm um, uh, uh, producing semiconductor. Ah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Instead, instead of uh, we're creating more oxides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people usually will be afraid of the oxide. For us, uh, for 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 our team, I always say that uh, we have to try to make uh, to 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 kind of like uh, why not? Not why, but mm -hmm. why not? So this is Thank and uh, yeah. Thank you, Doctor David. Can I have a follow up question? Yeah, 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 sure. You can act directly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm also actually very interested in oxide semiconductors. So, and usually, uh, you know, uh, metal excess or oxygen deficient, those conditions can affect the characteristics of oxide semiconductors. How far did uh, those ambient condition, if you have a lot of nitrogen around the surrounding uh, your plasma and, and during the process, how far did it uh, affect the characteristics of your oxide semiconductors? Well, uh, it's a very good question. Thank you very much. Um, how far in here is this tons of <laughs> roadmap? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, 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 uh, did the conductivity of these uh, semiconductors change a lot with different kinds of ambient or or, or those kind of uh, uh, pictures? Okay, uh, thank you very much. So for the conductivity itself, um, we do know in the, uh, if, you, if you understand a, a, more about the uh, conductivity, uh, once we treat it, we, we have, like I've mentioned earlier also that we have to understand more about what is our aim and which gas, uh, which, which gas sources that we have to use before we use it. So, we need to uh, we need to study it more about it first and how far. Uh, if you are using if you are using argon and hydrogen, we could increase the conductivity very much. Uh, this is what uh, this is recently that uh, we, we 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 are dealing actually. So, for example, in our um, in our production line, we treated it with. Uh, let me try to remember which gas that we treated that one. 
uh, we treat it with argon, argon, and hydro, argon and hydrogen, and then also we, we treat it with the CDA. So uh, obviously, before it is ready to be commercialized, we need to deal with some testing, which is like a high temperature storage and then uh, 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 thermal stressing and then electrical, uh, electrical stressing, something like that. So uh, we have database of that. And um, so what, what I meant in here is that uh, the oxide itself will not be that harmful if we try to treat it very well. It, it sounds a bit crazy actually when, 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 when you heard about that. So uh, it's because of if you are familiar with the whisker, for example, uh, we, need to, we need that oxide because of if the oxide, the atoms of the oxide is breaking, it's, 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 it's broken, then the whisker will grow. So we, we need to neglecting, neglecting this kind of situation also. Uh, do, you, do, you, do, you get, do you get, uh, sorry, do you, do you get my, uh, my answer? It sounds crazy that we need the oxygen in this case because of, we do not want to have a whisker growing. Okay, yeah, yeah. This is actually very interesting and I think we can continue uh, okay. If there's any time, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very yeah, sure, much. Sure, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rafi. Thank you, Dr. Dewi. Okay, so we have, we still have two questions left. And, um, and not much time, so better to move on. Um, from uh, Wayan Sri Fitriya, uh, I would like to know about your point of view about the TRL in Indonesia in general? Maybe Prof, uh, Dr. Iswandaru can answer this question. Uh, yes, a very good question. And it's very difficult one to answer as well, because uh, it depends on uh, uh, which uh, sector uh, in, in, in the business or which sector in the profession that uh, you, you are referring to uh, in, in these questions. If you're talking about the, uh, uh, the academia uh, in, in, at the universities, I think historically uh, universities uh, might stop uh, typically uh, in general uh, to level three or four, whereby the concept would be proven either theoretically or up to validation at laboratory levels, and then it stopped. Uh, but uh, in the last uh, five years or so, we have seen so many universities now becoming uh, more commercially uh, engaged, i.e. Uh, they started promoting uh, spin-off uh, uh, companies uh, from uh, their students who develop further uh, the innovations or their associated uh, partner to develop innovations which were developed uh, by the university. You can see a lot of uh, startups, uh, spin-off company uh, uh, coming up. So that readiness levels uh, increase further into more um, exploring the market, trialing uh, the innovation into the market up to promoting the innovation into the market. Uh, so, so that has been growing and growing. Uh, probably I, I will not be able to give you one answer, but there are more than one answer for this, depending upon uh, which sector area. On the industry side, again, it depends on which industry we are referring to, but uh, just by looking uh, from, from the outside, from outside uh, Indonesia, uh, I don't know exactly what happens inside Indonesia, but uh, I, it is just my intu intuition. I feel that many of the innovation uh, also appear to be imported innovation, i.e. some things already be uh, either uh, well established or uh, require a little bit of validation to be introduced in Indonesia. Uh, then in Indonesia, you just need to try to, to make sure the market will be ready for the innovation. So that, that's a different, uh, uh, different levels that we can look into on, on the commercial aspect. So I think it, it, my, my message probably uh, we just need to, to check where we are and what we're trying to achieve 
and then we start con considering how to achieve what we are trying to achieve. So it's, it's not one answer, but uh, there are possibilities here. But I'm, I'm confident with all the optimism, uh, the energy that has been spent uh, at the university level and the industry in general. I think in Indonesia is uh, is growing and growing and improving their uh, implementation of uh, new ideas, new technologies into uh, into the market or into uh, public life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eswandero. Uh, and for the last question um, to uh, both speakers. Uh, I want to thank, uh, I want to ask whether environmentally friendly technology can have a stable work increase on technological efficiency if we with previous technology. And what will be uh, the, um, sorry, not, not so really, um, not so clear question, but I think that that's the point, yeah. Uh, yeah, can we have a technology which is uh, environmentally friendly, but also have a, a better better quality or better um, yeah technology rather than before, rather than previous technology? So please, Dr. Iswandaru. Yes, uh, thank you. It's very good questions. Uh, well, I've presented about all those challenges when dealing with. Uh, uh, green technologies or when dealing with materials uh, derived from uh, waste uh, materials. How to make it more efficient? Uh, we can make it more efficient by adopting uh, a, a different processes or an, another technologies into the process. For example, um, well, uh, if you search around, I, I've presented uh, a, a different presentations about uh, the use of a recent uh, technology or digital technologies to promote efficiency, in, including efficiency in green technologies. So basically, if you have a good suite of uh, monitoring system, uh, which uh, can be digitalized, and you can generate or collect a lot of data from each process of the development, the historical record of the waste material or the green technologies, and you can put them into one uh, equations or one considerations, and you can create a model, uh, be it uh, digital models or uh, any models that you would like to use based on the data that you have. And you can simulate the efficiency levels. And then that's how you can improve the efficiency. i give you one example uh, from uh, a life project uh, uh, here in, in England. Actually, by using this kind of process, you can get efficiency between 50 to 90%, depending upon the activities that you do during that process. So yes, efficiency can be done, but you need to do it diligently and by incorporating other technologies like uh, the uh, digital technologies, uh, having a good database system and good uh, simulation and modeling uh, uh, aspects into it as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rob, Dr. Do you want to give uh, the last answer as the <laughs> for closing our discussion session? Okay, oh, thank you very much. It's also, a, yeah, it's a good question. And I agree with Dr. Swandar with that digital, uh, digital one. So uh, it's a first, uh, we have to, I agree that we have to incorporate with the uh, other technologies, for example, like a uh, data collection and then, uh, um, data collection and then modeling and then, uh, uh, for example, like a, uh, we try, we could try to simulate and do the deep learning process, something like our machine learning process. So we could find out uh, which uh, which uh, which uh, which roadmap is better or something like that. So I agree with that actually. Yeah. This is actually, I believe that everyone has been developing it right now that uh, we have the uh, practical, we have the theoretical one and then the uh, modeling one and then the uh, uh, practical one. And finally, which one, and finally we have a big database and just pick which one, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the,
question and answer from both speakers. Um, as for the final uh, session, I would like to invite everyone to open the camera so that we can have a photograph of all. Okay, Dr. Refli, are you available? And everyone, and Barianti. Uh, okay, so I will take a picture. Gallery view, wait. Okay, one. Okay. Uh, wait. Okay. okay, I think everybody is already in the room. Thank you so much. Um, so the last but not the least, um, finally we came to the end of the uh, session. I would like to say thank you so much for uh, speakers and also for the organizing committee for uh, holding this uh, seminar. And, uh, Hopefully the presentation will be beneficial for everybody. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. Uh, Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So I, um, uh, Bawidya, are you here? Okay, so we can, can we end the session now? Yes, sure, uh, Ibu Tuti. Yeah, thank you, thank you thank so much, so much. Uh, Dr. Iswandaru and Dr. Dewi for attending uh, today's upbringing session. We hope Tomorrow that uh, yeah. we hope that we can uh, see you soon uh, in face to face or virtual. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, participants. Thank you. Also, thank you, everybody.